Thank you, David. I want to thank Pastor Gary for asking me to come down here this morning from our sister church up in North Sewickley Township, Concord United Methodist. In fact, the uh, service up there, the 830 service, is just about over. <clears throat> but <clears throat> it is a thrill to be here this morning to share with you about what God has done in my life, and I just get so excited in sharing it with other people. So again, I thank Pastor Gary for allowing me to come down and share. I'd like to share with you <clears throat> three verses of Scripture, short, short verses. The first one is from the book of Acts, one of my favorite chapters written by the Apostle Paul. It's Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The second two verses are from Romans chapter 8, verses 6 and 7. The mind of the sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. And the third one is from Galatians 5, verse 17. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit that is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not want to do what you want. Let's pray. Lord, I come this morning asking that the words of my mouth be acceptable and a blessing to those who are here and are able to hear it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'd like to speak to you this morning a few moments on this topic. The value of being a Christian. The value of being a Christian. And before we get deeper into that, I want to emphasize two words that we saw and can be interpreted in the verses of Scripture that I read to you. Number one is the word power that is found in Acts 1, verse 8. Power can be defined as the ability to act or some potential capacity, strength, force that is actually put forth into whatever activity you're doing. It's a great force and has a great effect on our lives. Now, we sometimes think of the word power. I like to liken it to the Pittsburgh sports teams. Right now, we're in the baseball season. In baseball, you have what's called a power hitter. I go back to the days of Ralph Kiner and Willie Stargell and Barry Bonds. Those were power hitters because they could hit a ball out of the park. And in the last number of years, if they really had a lot of power, it would go into the river. Now that's power. With the Steelers, you have what we call a power running back. Go back to the days of John Henry Johnson and Franco Harris and Jerome Bettis. They were called power runners. Power runners. And of course, in hockey, you have what's called the power play. When one team commits a violation of one of the rules, that man 
for that team, he is penalized. He goes into what we call the penalty box, and the Penguins, they now have a power play for a certain amount of time. They have an advantage of one player, sometimes two players, and it's called a power play. And of course, in golf, you have the Tiger Woods and the Arnold Palmers and the Jack Nicklaus. They showed extreme power when they could tee off and hit a ball straight, which is what I can't do. Their power would allow them to hit that ball maybe 300 yards. I'm lucky if I can hit it straight for 150 yards. That's power. But you know the difference? All of those types of power, they're just temporary. Sometimes they're unfortunate. And a lot of times it's just pure luck that they can exhibit that power. But I can tell you this morning, none of those examples of power will even come close to the power that God gives us through the Holy Spirit. Doesn't even come close. How many of you have ever flown a kite? Back in Shanksville, Somerset County, where I was born and raised, when I was a kid, I flew a kite because up there in the mountains you had a lot of wind. That kite would go up in the air and the wind would come along the wind would come along, and that was the power that kept that kite up there. That's like the witness of the power of the Holy Spirit that comes within us when God gives us that holy power. We may not see the evidence of it, but we can feel it. We can feel that tug, just like the kite. I could feel the tug as that kite went higher and the wind got stronger. But we could feel with the Holy Spirit that God gives us, we can always feel that tug, just like the kite. We can feel it in our hearts. And every time we feel that tug in our hearts from the Holy Spirit that God gave us, we know for sure that we are in touch with God and that he is in touch with us. The second word that I want to define that relates to the passages of scripture that I shared with you <clears throat> is the word value. Value can be described as desirability. But many times when we talk about the word value, we have make a slash and then we add the word cost or price. The value of being a Christian, we don't have to worry about the cost or the price. Jesus has already paid it. It's paid in full. We don't have to worry about it. John 3.16, probably the most popular verse in the whole Bible, kind of sums it up. Because John 3.16 talks about the value and the dependability of the past the present, and the future. Matthew 6.33, which incidentally is another one of my favorite passages. I don't normally share this, but <clears throat> I have my alarm clock set for 6.33 every morning. And when that alarm clock goes off, there it is, Matthew 6.33. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. And if you do that, all these things will be given to you. Isaiah 61, 1. The spirit of the Lord is in me. Psalm 69, 33. The Lord hears the needy and does not despise the captive people. Value versus cost. 
my lovely wife, who will be joining us here at the 11 o'clock service, <clears throat> I've always told her, honey, when you go shopping, which she does quite a bit, I said, if you happen to find a dress or a pair of shoes, you like the color, you like the size, they feel comfortable, they, you, 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 just, you just want to have them. They're going to give you value. Don't worry about what the cost is. Buy them. Same way with your dresses. If you find something that's going to give you value, don't worry about the cost. We do it with cars. We do it with everything that we buy. That's why we have value. If it meets what I call your wants, dreams, needs, and desires, and it's giving you value, go ahead and buy it. Forget the price. What's the cost? What's the value to you? Martin Luther was once asked, what's the greatest thing you ever thought about? It didn't take him long to answer by saying, my accountability to Almighty God. I've heard it said, yeah, you can, you can fool the pastor, the principal, the policeman, the, your parents, your grandparents, the teacher. But you can't fool God. You can't fool God. You might be able to hide from him, but you can't fool him. So let me share with you this morning four things about the value of being a Christian. And ironically, all four items start with the letter S. <laughs> Number one, it's simple. It's simple. Acts 16 says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved period. It's that simple. It's that simple. Up at Concord, our theme for years has been the three B's. Belong, believe, and become. Keep it simple. But you know, folks, sometimes the simple things can cause problems, even within the church. I have heard people down through the years complain about what type of baptism should we use. I've heard them complain about should we wear makeup, not wear makeup, how long should our hair be? <clears throat> Those of us who still have a little hair, how long should it be? The type of communion, people get hung up on the hang-ups type of clothes you wear, the type of music that's played. Down in West Virginia, they get hung up on who should handle the snakes. When I hear about the snake handlers down there, I'm always reminded of the story that I shared. They had a revival down there in the middle of West Virginia one year, and. The evangelist came in and they had a guest that evening and we got to the handling of the snakes. And the evangelist walked back the aisle and there was one gentleman, the visitor, he was just sitting there. And the evangelist came up to him and said, sir, I notice that you're not handling the snakes. Wouldn't you handle, like to handle the snakes? And the gentleman said, no. If the Holy Spirit came down in this pew where I'm sitting and told me to handle the snakes, 
I would. But it didn't, and I won't. And he didn't. We try to keep things simple. Sometimes when I get into discussions with other theologians or people, and I determine that I'm not getting very far, I tell them, this is my final statement. God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Because if you look at the good book, I like the first four words. In the beginning, God. And if you look at the end of Revelation, we win. We win. So that settles it. So number one, it's simple. Number two, it's sweet. A lot of songs out there written using the word sweet. I like the one that says, or it's entitled, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus." Just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise and know this saith the Lord. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood. And in simple faith, to purge me neath the healing, cleansing flood. Third verse says, yes, tis sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to cease, just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. And of course, the course we're all familiar with. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. You know, we live our daily lives. We go out every day, and we trust a lot of people. We trust our doctors, our pharmacists, our mechanic, our pilot that flies the airplane, our ship's captain. We trust the emergency responders. We, we trust the police. We trust our preachers, our spouse, our family, our friends, the company works for. And sometimes we even trust the weatherman. All these are just words sometimes, and we have to put our words into actions. We have to put our words into deeds. We have to make our words sometimes change our attitude. I always have said, your attitude determines your altitude. Your attitude determines your altitude. The word sweet. Now you're going to have to practice this. This is a test right now. I want you all to smile. Thank you, David. I want you all to smile. Okay, good. Everybody is smiling. 1962, there was a hymn written called Sweet, Sweet, Spirit. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. And I know that it's the spirit of the Lord. <clears throat> Here you go. I want to see it. There are sweet expressions on each face. And I know that you all feel the presence of the Lord. You did real well. You all get an A. Sweet Holy Spirit, sweet heavenly dove, stay right here with us, filling us with your love. 
And for those blessings, we lift our hearts in praise. Without a doubt, we'll know that we have been revived when we shall leave this place. And there's an old southern gospel hymn. Some of you maybe know my wife, and she's from the south. And I was born and raised in a Lutheran church in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. My wife is a southern Baptist gal. <laughs> and when we first got married... A Lutheran and a Southern Baptist. My, oh, my, oh, my. Then we both became Methodists. And we both got saved. That was almost 55 years ago. And I still love her just as much as I ever did when I first met her at Sears and Roebuck in Huntington, West Virginia. <laughs> Don't tell her I said this, but, you know, Sears is no longer admitted, so I can't take her back. <laughs> and she said, yeah, I had my warranties up, so you have to keep me. I said, okay. I keep falling in love with him, is this him that I was talking about? And the chorus goes like this. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. I just keep falling in love with him over and over and over. He gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Oh, what a love between my Lord and I. I just keep falling in love with him over and over and over again. It's simple, and it's sweet. Number three, it's satisfying. It's satisfying. Doctor once said to the gentleman, after he examined him, he said, Sir, as I understand it, you don't smoke, drink, do drugs, or stay out after after midnight. Don't you have any fun at all or do anything that's satisfying? The man just smiled and said, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. And I'm just passing through on my way home. And I'm having so much fun. I wish there were more hours in the day to enjoy it. It's very satisfying. One of my favorite stories in the Bible is in the book of Acts, when Paul and Silas were arrested and thrown in the Philippian jail, locked up, and at midnight, at midnight, they were having so much fun, they were praying and singing and singing and praying, and as the The jail cells burst open. The jailer was about to kill himself because they had escaped. And God broke open the door of the jail cell. Paul said, don't harm yourself. We're still here. I think at that point in time, that Philippian jailer realized they were having so much fun And they were satisfied with what the power of the Holy Spirit had given to Paul that that jailer wanted what they had. And at midnight, not just the jailer, but the jailer's whole family got saved and turned their life over to the power of the Holy Spirit. Number four, it's successful. You know, success is not just a destination, but it's a process. And we have to work at it in order to be successful. I love the story of the the grandmother who was sitting out one evening in in the fall on her front porch, 
sitting in her rocking chair, reading the Bible. And her granddaughter came by that evening and said, Grandma, why do you keep sitting here on your rocking chair every evening reading your Bible? The grandmother smiled and said, Sweetheart, I'm preparing for my final exam before I die. You know, I've, in 50-some years of doing this, I've never met a person sorry they were a Christian. And I've got to tell you, I've met some sorry Christians, but I've never met a person sorry they were a Christian. I've always said, if the Lord is good enough for you when you're dying, you ought to try him while you're living. He's not going to hurt you. He's not going to hurt you. I tell people I'm absolutely, positively, 100% sure that I know where I'm going when I die. I'm just not quite ready to take the next load going in. I have some things I want to accomplish. It's still a process. But I will be successful when that day comes. When I arrive at that mansion and I hear those words, Welcome home, my good and faithful servant. Ira Stanfield, probably might know Ira Stanfield. He wrote a song in 1949 called Mansion Over the Hilltop. I'm satisfied with just a cottage below a little silver and a little gold. But in that city where the ransomed will shine, I want a gold one that's silver lined. Though often tempted, tormented, and tested, and like the prophet, my pillow a stone. And though I find no permanent dwelling, I know he'll give me a mansion of my own. Don't think me poor or deserted or lonely. I'm not discouraged. I'm heaven bound. I'm just a pilgrim in search of a city. I want a mansion, a harp, and a crown. And the chorus goes, I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow old. And someday yonder, we will never more wander, but walk the streets that are purest gold. And that, my friends, is the value of being a Christian. Let us pray. Lord, we are standing this morning on holy ground and we can sense that that spirit and that power that was described in Acts 1-8 has moved within this sanctuary this morning. And I pray now that the power of the Holy Spirit will give us value to our lives as we continue to live and serve and worship and praise and be thankful for Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And as this service comes to an end, and as we go out and go about our work, let us constantly be reminded of the value of being a Christian. It's simple, it's sweet, it's satisfying, and it's successful. All this we ask in your name. And everybody said, Amen.
Thank you all very much.